The subcommittee is now in order. Welcome everyone to our hearing of the United States Senate Space and Science Subcommittee. Thank you to each of our witnesses for their participation today. Thanks to subcommittee ranking member Schmidt for working with me on these issues and to Chair Cantwell and Ranking Member Cruz for their collaboration. Today's hearing comes at a critical time for the commercial space industry. Bold, flexible, bipartisan policies have fostered U.S. commercial space from its infancy to the world's gold standard of today. It's not a coincidence that the United States is both the only country where private companies are engaged in human spaceflight and the world leader in space innovation and development. Continued American leadership depends on a robust private sector. Space innovation is no longer the exclusive domain of the government. As private companies bring private citizens to space, we can see the immense potential of commercial human spaceflight. Commercial space activities can now go from theoretical to very real at lightning speed. Commercial space companies right now employ thousands of Americans, have nationwide supply chains, and leverage the already immense economic impact of government space operations. America's private space efforts are all the more critical with increasing global investments in space, including from foreign competitors and adversaries like Russia and China. My home state of Arizona continues its space leadership with significant commercial space investment. Virgin Galactic's massive manu manufacturing complex in Mesa is set to be operational next year. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new Delta fleet roll out in time for 2025 flight testing. That means meaningful careers for Arizonans and a tremendous boost to the local economy. Earlier this year, Blue Origin opened a 43,000 square foot office in Phoenix, taking advantage of the region's excellent engineering talent to further its avionics, systems engineering, and supply chain management. And I'm sure the breathtaking mountain views don't hurt. Along with hundreds of employees, Blue Origin is also investing hundreds of millions of dollars in local Arizona firms to support all of its programs, including commercial human spaceflight. These investments follow recent large-scale expansions of existing facilities by Northrop Grumman and Boeing. My alma mater, Arizona State University, launched New Space, an unprecedented collaboration effort integrating academic and commercial space enterprises. Now, SpaceX may not yet have Arizona facilities, but it did successfully launch the ASU-led Psyche spacecraft on one of its Falcon Heavy rockets just last Friday. And all of this investment benefits from public space projects. In Arizona alone, NASA accounted for over $700 million and over 3,800 jobs in 2021. Progress in commercial space finds us at the dawn of a new space age. Much of the industry, particularly human spaceflight, is just now entering phases of rapid development. Commercial human spaceflights did not become a regular occurrence until the last few years. And I'm glad to have all three private companies currently fly flying humans into space here today so we can hear how the government can help boost and safeguard your operations. Congress finds itself with a unique opportunity to help grow an industry with vast potential and important responsibility to do so carefully. We must maintain U.S. leadership by ensuring our space industry retains the freedom to innovate without compromising safety. We must draw on prior experience and take the same enterprising, pioneering approach to commercial space that has served us so well in earlier generations. We need to streamline authorization processes, enable a workable safety framework for in-space operations, and clearly define proper responsibilities for government agencies in commercial space. I believe this requires a flexible regulatory environment, able to attack the issues of today head on without compromising adaptability for the issues of tomorrow. We must address the learning period, mission authorization, and other pressing matters in a way that looks ahead to the future with unknown capabilities. To do this, we need to account for the diversity of operations in commercial space and the human spaceflight industry. Our three industry representatives today show how there is no singular approach to human spaceflight. Laws and regulations must account for diversity without sacrificing efficiency. To maintain our leadership and competitiveness in the growing commercial space economy, we will also need a strong workforce to support it. I'm passionate about making sure that Americans and Arizonans have rewarding careers to choose from when graduating either from a certificate program, vocational school, or with advanced degrees. 
encouraging public-private partnerships and leveraging existing expertise of entities like NASA will be critical. Regulators must also be given proper resources to keep pace with growing industry. We cannot expect any regulatory framework to function without the necessary expertise to oversee such a complex industry. So thank you. And I'll now turn to Ranking Member Sh Schmidt for his <laughs> opening statement. It's not the first time that's happened. <laughs> It's, it's the actually, first time here. It's actually not the first time today. <laughs> right. I've been called worse. You're recognized. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, the witnesses, uh, for, for joining us here today. Uh, my home state of Missouri has helped chart the path of human exploration. As the gateway to the West, Lewis and Clark set out from St. Charles, Missouri, at the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi Rivers to further our nation's westward expansion to the Pacific Ocean. Additionally, Marshfield, Missouri's native son, Edwin Hubble, proved that there were galaxies beyond the Milky Way offering new realms of discovery. America's drive for exploring the unknown has always been a unifying force for our country, and our nation has and always should be at the forefront of exploration, period. Dating back to the advent of the space race and human exploration in the Mercury missions, the need for the U.S. to be the preeminent leader in space has been critical to our national and economic security. Then Russia was our key adversary, today it's China. The US is privileged to have some of the foremost aerospace companies in the world, with three of them represented in front of us here today. As ranking member of the Space and Science Subcommittee, I wanna do everything in my power uh, to leverage the abilities and, innovate, and innovation of, the US company, of those US companies in order to maintain American space dominance. When considering new frameworks for regulation in space, it is imperative that the appropriate agencies develop thoughtful, light-touch standards for the development and deployment of technologies of suborbital, orbital, cislunar, and lunar commercial operations. Innovation thrives under light-touch regulations, not the heavy hand of government. The FAA's moratorium on regulating commercial spaceflight operations, otherwise known as the learning period, is set to expire on January 1st, 2024. The learning period has afforded us the robust commercial spaceflight industry we have here today. It's important uh, that that learning period be extended to provide both industry and the FAA enough time and data to establish an appropriate off-ramp to a more permanent framework for the commercial space industry. We must also streamline and reform existing regulations within the FAA and the Department of Commerce to refocus our federal agency's core functions on t of timely licensing and safety to ensure that the American companies lead the world. I have led efforts here in the Senate with my colleague, Senator Hickenluber, to streamline the FCC's role in spectrum licensing for commercial space launch and reentry to provide a more certain and timely licensing process that keeps pace with the increased launch and reentry demands of the commercial space industry. That bill has passed committee and I hope we can get it passed on the floor actually this week. I intend to take that same approach and an approach that emphasizes timely review and approval of licenses and certifications when it comes to the processes at the FAA and the Department of Commerce. Additionally, it's important that the larger commercial space industry has regulatory certainty and clarity to plan for the future to head off the larger threat of China and our adversaries in space. If federal agencies continue to, st to stray from their core functions or add to the current bureaucratic, bureau bureaucratic mess, we could very well see valuable American companies leave our shores. I, for one, and I know my colleagues join me in not wanting to see that happen. I believe that those agencies play an important and critical role in com commercial space development. However, when agencies start stepping uh, in overreach, uh, it becomes unclear what, what the agency guidance actually is and in who's in charge of what. We only further put ourselves at a disadvantage. Congress should not stand idly by and watch agency turf wars. We must be clear-eyed about the goal, stopping China through American space dominance. To me, nothing could be more important. Madam Chair, as we look uh, to the new frontier of space ex exploration in future generations, America must be the first back to the moon, the first nation to set foot on Mars, the first nation to capture and harness the resources of galactic asteroids. These goals are vital to the next stage of human curiosity. Our future generations depend on us to get this right. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses here today to ensure this committee develops a thoughtful and balanced approach to any future commercial space 
um, exploration bill or commercial space bill that promotes, not hinders, American industry. I yield back. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Our first witness is Karen Shinnewerk. Ms. Shinnewerk is the president of CS Consulting and an adjunct space law professor at Georgetown University Law Center. She was formerly the vice president for government affairs at Relativity, Relativity Space and spent 10 years at SpaceX. You are recognized for your opening statement. Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to share my perspective on the U.S. commercial space industry. I am honored to appear before the committee in my personal capacity, and I'm not representing any company or client's views. My testimony is focused on a few key points regarding U.S. space law and policy governing private space activities. I hope to convey that space is highly regulated and that maintaining America's competitive edge in space is increasingly dependent on improving and streamlining existing regulatory processes. It also depends on our ability to develop an efficient and effective approach to authorizing exciting new or so-called novel space activities. My first point, the US space industry is highly regulated and encompasses a diverse range of activities with different levels of maturity and customers. As such, it operates in accordance with a multitude of local, state, and federal laws, and depending on where companies operate, they may also be subject to foreign laws. U.S. space companies are licensed based on their primary activities, launch, reentry, remote sensing, and telecommunications by the FAA, NOAA, and FCC, respectively. That said, each of those activities may also require licenses from one or both of the non-primary agencies. Importantly, we do not have a one-stop shop approach to licensing space activities. Second, launch and reentry companies are subject to US law no matter where they operate, and an efficient approach to regulating them is crucial to their success. Such jurisdiction was established in the 1994 Commercial Space Launch Act and conforms to the United States' international treaty obligations. The primary focus of the CSLA-based licensing regulations and review for launch and reentry is public safety, which requires the FAA to review the design, operation, and testing of a vehicle's flight safety system, as well as aspects like vehicle hazards, including debris, toxic release, and overpressure. As outlined in my written statement, obtaining a launch or reentry license is an extensive multi-year effort. Recent changes to the FAA's regulations have not resulted in streamlined licensing reviews. Instead, Part 450 has proven more cumbersome and costly. To date, only four licenses have been issued under Part 450, and at least two of those exceeded the FAA's 180-day statutory timeline. With respect to human spaceflight, the learning period or moratorium does not limit all regulatory oversight. For example, the FAA regulates to protect crew members because they are part of a vehicle's flight safety system, which falls within FAA's public safety authority. There are regulations regarding spaceflight participants as well, including their training and their acceptance of risk. Given the limited number of private human spaceflights, three orbital and 10 suborbital, the ongoing opportunities for thoughtful engagement between the FAA and industry as well as the FAA's challenges with implementing its existing regulations, the original premise underpinning the learning period still appears solid. Next, I'd like to focus on novel activities, an emerging aspect of the space market. These include in-space servicing, assembly and manufacturing, in-space destinations such as private LEO space stations, and moon or Mars-based capabilities. These are exciting endeavors that do not clearly fall within FAA, FCC, or NOAA's licensing regimes. Significant support exists for the Commerce Department's Office of Commercial Space having mission authority over novel space activities. I recommend that this committee support efforts to clarify agency authorities in a manner that is appropriate to the in-space activities and ensure that any regulatory regime is well-defined. Continued uncertainty will diminish U.S. space leadership and is costly to companies developing these novel and necessary capabilities. Lastly, effective regulatory regimes require resourced, trained, and organized regulators who engage meaningfully with cutting edge innovations. US space, law and policy, US space policy and legal oversight is extensive 
and we must continuously work to make sure its implementation is keeping pace with industry's rapid technological and scientific advances. Sometimes the safest approach may not look like the status quo. As the committee considers commercial space legislation, it has the opportunity to continue U.S. leadership in diminishing regulatory uncertainty while facilitating continued space safety, innovation, and competitiveness. Thank you for the time you are investing in developing balanced and thoughtful legislation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our second witness today is Wayne Monteith. Mr. Monteith is the President and General Manager of National Aerospace Solutions and the Vice President of Bechtel National. He was formerly the FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation and a Commander of Air Force Space Launch Activities. You're recognized for your opening statement. Uh, Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear before this committee once again and share my perspectives on this important topic. I'm appearing today in my personal capacity and, and I am not representing the views of any company, client, or government entity. My views are heavily influenced by my 29 years of active duty service in the United States Air Force, culminating as the commander of the 45th Space Wing in Florida, the busiest, most successful spaceport in the world and my time as the previous, previous FAA Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. I last appeared before this committee in 2019. The number of FAA licensed commercial launch and reentry activities increased from 29 that year to 96 already this calendar year, more than tripling the cadence of activity. In terms of commercial human space flight, we went from one in 2019 to eight so far in 2023. As impressive as these increases are, I expect it to be even more dramatic going forward as we continue to place more and more satellites on orbit, move from human adventure flights to on-orbit habitats to the moon and beyond. During the same time frame, the FAA published a new streamlined launch and reentry regulation that was envisioned to enhance safety and have a lighter regulatory touch while also being more flexible, accommodating to innovation, more responsive to the rapid pace of industry change and operational timelines, and less burdensome than the existing four regulations it was replacing. Unfortunately, there are many in industry that would say this goal was not achieved. So I remain concerned this continued growth will be negatively impacted by an overly burdensome or inefficient regulatory construct or a very public catastrophic event involving humans. Sound or even perfect regulations and good intentions cannot eliminate all risk, but hastily developed regulations or an overly risk averse or understaffed regulator can suboptimize or eliminate innovation, new entrants, and U.S. global leadership. As the committee considers the near and long term future of U.S. commercial spaceflight, I would like to offer three recommendations for consideration. First, I am not advocating for additional regulatory oversight on human spaceflight, but I do recommend that any change to the regulatory landscape be provided ample time for meaningful collaboration with industry, meaningful coordination within the interagency, and enough staff for the regulator to meet current obligations while providing the appropriate level of effort on the new regulation. This would be a multi-year process to do correctly. Second, I believe a more efficient one-stop shop approach to authorizing and licensing space activities is necessary. In, January 1984, in a January 1984 speech, then Secretary of Transportation Elizabeth Dole explained the President wanted to stimulate interest in commercial space ventures by removing regulatory barriers. Secretary Dole said that companies trying to operate in space must go through as many as 17 agencies to get appropriate permits and licenses. A one-stop one service would help them cut through the thicket of clearances, licenses, and regulations that keep industrial space vehicles tethered to their pads. I suggest we may not have completely solved the original problem that led to the creation of FAA AST. Therefore, the committee may wish to consider exploring opportunities to consolidate government oversight responsibilities. Finally, as the committee is well aware, the current regulatory construct for commercial human spaceflight is limited by the moratorium or learning period, originally established in 2004 and scheduled to sunset yet again in January. The moratorium for this still nascent sector appropriately limits the FAA's regulatory oversight of the health and safety of commercial human spaceflight participants. 
Instead of extending the moratorium, I recommend the, con the committee consider establishing a date in which a new regulation on commercial human spaceflight activities may not be published sooner than, and then establish a subsequent future date before the regulation can actually become effective. The process can begin soon to fully and thoughtfully develop a regulation with industry, should it be needed, and allows Congress the option of delaying the effective date should the rule, new rule be early to need. Madam Chair, I appreciate your invitation to testify before the committee. It is important that we work through these complex issues to ensure an appropriate level of safety and a light regulatory touch. It is also important that whatever regulatory approach is taken, it enables our current industry leaders to continue to be safe and successful and allows for the next disruptive innovator to successfully enter the market. This will foster competition and help ensure the United States continues its global leadership in this vital transportation sector. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our next witness is Sarisha Bandla. Ms. Bandla is the President of Government Affairs and Research Operations for Virgin Galactic. She's also the only panelist here today to have gone to space flying on Virgin Galactic's Unity 22 mission. You're recognized for your opening statement. Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, thank you so much for the opportunity to, opportunity to speak today on behalf of Virgin Galactic. The importance of this hearing is significant in, the, in furthering the progress of the commercial spaceflight industry, and we appreciate the scope and the attention of the committee. Now, I've wanted to go to space since I was little. Uh, I wanted to adventure out into the unknown as the captain of my own starship and follow in the footsteps of those that explored the stars before me. You know, Neil Armstrong, Sally Ride, Kalpana Chawla, Jean-Luc Picard. But I have very bad eyesight, and going to space in the way I had known it growing up through the NASA's astronaut corps was just not achievable until the advent of commercial human spaceflight. Companies creating accessible and frequent access to space for anyone that wanted to experience it. I joined Virgin Galactic in 2015. Galactic is the world's first commercial space line, pioneering human spaceflight for private individuals and researchers with their advanced air and space vehicles. Galactic's vehicles have been designed to set new standards for human spaceflight safety, frequency, flexibility, and cost. Our company's mission is to democratize access to space to, by providing frequent private astronaut journeys, microgravity research, and spaceflight training opportunities. Now, spaceflight is an experience that changes your perception and your view of life on Earth. I was lucky enough to embark on that experience with Virgin Galactic when I flew with five of my crew members aboard our spaceship VSS Unity, fulfilling a lifelong dream. And that is the hope, the mission, the vision of why we're all here to discuss current and future policies that could shape the growth of this industry. An industry that has the potential to open space access for researchers and scientists that will further our understanding of our universe, our planet, and our place in it. An industry that has the potential to send more of our national and international astronaut corps to explore further destinations as humanity reaches further into the cosmos. And an industry that can open space up for all artists, educators, lawyers, members of Congress, and their staff, for anyone who wants to embark on the journey. While the US has over 60 years of history in spaceflight and an immense database of spaceflight technology that many in industry, including Virgin Galactic, utilize, the commercial human spaceflight industry is relatively new. Until recently, human spaceflight has primarily been in the domain of governments, and access to space for humans was largely reserved for those in the National Astronaut Corps. To date, only 670 people have gone to space, and of those 670, only 64 ha were non-government astronauts who flew on commercial vehicles. And many of them flew within the last two years. And the world is paying attention, though often with mistaken assumptions. So while one of the important discussions today will center around the learning period and human occupant safety, it is important for us to remember through our discussions that this industry is indeed regulated. The FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation regulates commercial space operations to protect public safety and property, and currently has a perfect safety record. This includes rules that cover the licensing and landing, the launch and landing operations, as well as governing the establishment of spaceports. Intrinsically, regulating the vehicle for public safety does create a safer vehicle for the occupant. 
In addition, as the basis of our business, VG's highest priority is the safety of that of our crew and of our spaceflight participants. Now, Congress acknowledged that it is impossible for regulators to create effective regulations for diverse, innovative vehicles without sufficient data and created a regulatory learning period during which the FAA may only regulate for the safety of the public or in response to an incident. The rationale was that FAA regulatory burdens on a relatively new industry and rapidly evolving industry could slow innovation, particularly when it remains clear which areas FAA should regulate. And that's still true today. The learning period is currently scheduled to expire on January 1st, 2024. However, due to technical and economic challenges of space flight and the industry's emphasis on safety above all, commercial space companies have proceeded at a more cautious pace than envisioned in the original bill. And because of this, Galactic proposes extending the learning period to provide for a transition period utilizing collection of data and a standard development process to properly inform future safety frameworks and what areas the FAA should indeed regulate. The US is leading the world in commercial human spaceflight and the industry, while still in its infancy, is a beacon of innovation on and off this planet. I'm looking forward to discussing those policies that will prioritize safety while protecting the innovation that got us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next wit witness is William Gerstenmeier. Um, Chair Cinema has Gerst in quotes. Is that appropriate? <laughs> this is not my copy, but I'm going to go ahead with Gerst, take a, take a leap of faith here, uh, and is the Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability at SpaceX. He previously spent over 40 years in public service, including overseeing human spaceflight efforts at NASA. Mr. Gerstenmeier, you're recognized for your opening statement. Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. This is a critically important hearing. We're at an inflection point with incredible innovation in commercial space launch. The criticality is especially true in the face of strategic competition from state actors like China. SpaceX is under contract with NASA to use Starship to land American astronauts on the moon before China does. We are undertaking a campaign that requires many early test flights to rapidly mature and prove out the critical systems needed to safely land NASA astronauts on the lunar surface. We understand the vital importance of this national mission and the absolute need to protect the public during every phase of development. Starship has been ready for its next flight test for more than a month, but we are waiting for an FAA license and accompanying inter interagency review. The Office of Commercial Space Transportation, known as AST, must recognize where the industry is, where the industry is going, and its role in regulating this emerging industry. Promote, encourage, enable, and protect public safety. This was Congress's direction to the Commercial Space Act when it was written. To do this, the pace of American regulation much, must match the pace of American innovation. We are falling behind. I'm privileged to lead a team of outstanding safety and reliability engineers at SpaceX. I also serve in the control room as SpaceX's chief engineer for three private Dragon flights with space flight participants. Safety and reliability are everyone's responsibility at SpaceX and enables our current flight rate at about one launch every four days. Safety and reliability enable fl flight rate and do not inhibit. Regulations, likewise, can also be an enabler. As it relates to the topic of this hearing, I want to be clear that Congress should pass a multi-year extension for the human spaceflight learning period. Human spaceflight represents a tiny fraction of all space launches and is properly regulated today under a responsible and balanced framework given the nascent state of the industry. Much work is being done to think through what the future regulation may look like. We must get this right, and it will take time. It would be premature by several years to let the learning period lapse, so I call on Congress to extend it. With that said, I want to focus my testimony on AST's regulatory framework for launch and reentry licensing, which is in great distress. I want to state clearly that AST is an outstanding and important organization that needs more resources and immediate regulatory direction from Congress. AST's role is critical to enabling safe space transportation, but we're at a breaking point. AST has neither the resources nor the flexibility to implement its regulatory obligations. Licensing, including environmental approval, often takes longer than rocket development. 
This should never happen, and it's only getting worse. Our Starship, Falcon, and Dragon programs are encountering, reg are encountering regulatory headwinds and un unnecessary bureaucracy that has nothing to do with public safety. Regulation is important, but so are the technical challenges associated with de developing and operating transformative vehicle systems like Starship. In my written statement, I offer several specific proposals for the committee's consideration. As a summary, first, the AST licensing division needs at least twice the resources that they have today. We also recommend expedited hiring authority for AST to onboard additional qualified technical experts with an innovative mindset or to bring in outside help. Second, AST's role is to promote protect public safety, not to ensure success of rocket launches. Congress has been very clear about this. Space is not aviation. In space launch, as long as failure occurs safely, safe failure and rapid learning are often the fastest path to successful development. Third, AST's Part 450 regulations need to change. When it comes to projects of national interest, such as the Artemis program, Congress should establish a regulatory regime consistent with the national program objectives and schedules. Other government agencies that participate, participate in AST licensing, like those with environmental responsibilities, should also be required to complete their work consistent with the national program schedules. I thank the committee for convening this important hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our final witness is Phil Joyce. Mr. Joyce is the Senior Vice President of the New Shepard Business Unit at Blue Origin. He has spent over four decades in aerospace and defense work, including a focus on human spaceflight and launch vehicle development. Mr. Joyce, you're recognized for your opening statement. Chair Sinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Blue Origin's team is focused on radically reducing the cost of access to space, harnessing its vast resources and inspiring future generations. We build and operate reusable rocket engines and launch vehicles, in-space systems, and lunar landers. The products we create will enable our vision of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth, a vision that must be built on a foundation of safety, innovation, and competition. At Blue Origin, we recognize that the United States government is a critical partner in advancing our vision. On July 20th, 2021, our New Shepard suborbital rocket completed its first commercial human spaceflight, safely carrying four humans above the Kármán line and back to Earth. This milestone was made possible by a deliberate step-by-step -step test and verification program conducted over many years with a singular focus on safety. Since then, New Shepard has flown 5% of the world's population of astronauts above the Kármán line and almost 9% of the women, and many firsts for humans in space. Our astronauts return to Earth forever transformed by their experience and share this with the rest of the world to inspire positive change. Since the dawn of the space age, humans in space have united the planet, and there is no time like the present to remind us how critical this is for humanity. The first step to an enduring human presence in space is launch. The FAA's authority in this area is clear and its regulatory powers are extensive. Blue Origin and the other companies here provide the FAA with comprehensive data about our systems and processes to ensure the safety of the uninvolved public and property. Our recent experience partnering with the FAA to investigate a mishap on an uncrewed New Shepard flight is an example of the effectiveness of the current regulations. Our flight safety systems worked as designed and the FAA was able to efficiently verify this due to the insights we had provided through the licensing process. To continue promoting safety and innovation, the FAA needs three things. First, the FAA needs a more streamlined process to keep pace with industry, both the substance and administration of launch regulations should be improved. We encourage Congress to support the FAA's effort to generate guidance, process, tools, and training. This will allow the FAA to use their staff more efficiently without adding unnecessary burdens to operators. Second, the FAA needs sufficient resources to keep up with licensing. Congress and the FAA helped accelerate the development of the commercial spaceflight industry, and now the FAA is struggling to keep pace. 
Streamlined processes will help, but the FAA needs more funding to deal with the increase in launches. This is a great problem to have. It's why you passed the Commercial Space Launch Act in the first place. Third, the FAA needs time. The learning period is an opportunity for the FAA to gain experience in human spaceflight before it regulates further. The learning period should be extended. The FAA should be encouraged to talk, in, talk to industry, build consensus, and scale up its licensing capabilities. In the meantime, launch operations such as New Shepard will continue, and this will provide valuable insight to the FAA and the industry. Beyond the FAA, Congress should think broadly about how to build a framework for mission authorization. This should be correctly scoped and draw clear boundaries between ag agencies. We also recommend Congress designate a single agency as the hub for authorization of commercial space activity. In conclusion, com commercial human spaceflight is an American success story in progress. Congress has an opportunity to help write the next chapter and spur continued innovation in the space economy. From launch to the moon and beyond, U.S. leadership is a necessity. To cement our role, we need competitive regulatory environment, one that realizes the potential for commercial investment alongside our civil and national security initiatives. We look forward to making progress toward the dream of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much, Mr. Joyce. Um, I'm now going to recognize myself for a first round of questions. Uh, it took 16 years to launch the first commercial human spaceflight after the commercial learning period came into effect in 2005. There have been just 64 total private astronauts sent to space between three total companies, with most of those occurring in the last couple of years. A lack of flight data and widely diverse operations have made it difficult to find consensus on workable industry-wide passenger safety standards during the learning period. Uh, Ms. Bandla, you, you highlight in your testimony that Virgin's Galac Virgin Galactic's Mesa Manufacturing Complex is intended to accelerate progress from conceptual design to production to final assembly in order to reach a target of 400 flights per year. I'm not sure that the industry can reach this kind of scalability fast enough if we just extend the learning period without thinking through changes. So in your view, how should Congress best extend the learning period while ensuring sufficient collaboration between the FAA, industry, and other stakeholders so the FAA is prepared to holistically regulate human spaceflight safely? And what do you believe to be a proper timetable? Madam Chair, thank you for the question. And you're absolutely right. Um, the intent of the learning period was to allow commercial companies to look at spaceflight in a way that does not have bounds on prescribed regulations. So they had the ability to develop, to test new capabilities, new innovations, create, collect data, create a knowledge base of lessons learned to inform a future uh, safety framework. And again, you're correct, it, it, did, took, it took us a longer time than envisioned in that original bill because commercial spaceflight companies do hold safety above all and are cautious in proceeding forward because we are carrying humans. But we are at an inflection point. The companies here on the panel have entered commercial operations for human spaceflight and are starting to fly uh, for commercial purposes and at that regular cadence that we all envision. So it is now the time to have those discussions. And I completely agree, we should not be moving the goalpost just to move the goalpost. But now is the time, because we have data, we have operators, um, to discuss what that framework looks like. That's the important part. The learning period should not lapse without having a blueprint for what a safety framework looks like for human spaceflight so that um, we can look at what areas need to be regulated, what are the consequences of that, making sure it's still light touch to allow innovation, and also importantly that the FAA is resourced with the funds and the expertise to carry out that framework. So I completely agree, we shouldn't just extend, and there's uh, ways to rather extend, but to transition the industry. Without, without a lapse of the learning period, we take this time to get industry and uh, government stakeholders together to look at what that blueprint is, and it, it could include milestones, such as um, looking at safety standards, how safety standards are working, what area safety standards are being developed in industry, and how we can transfer that to a blueprint that, again, I must state, needs to be in place 
uh, before the learning period lapses. And uh, in terms of timeline, this is going to take a few years. While uh, we are entering commercial operations, Galactic has flown nine times, um, and we still, uh, I still believe that there should be more flights to collect data. Um, so about eight years is our timeline for, uh, ideal timeline for having these discussions. And do our other industry representatives have anything to add here before I move on to the next question? I think to your, your point, uh, one thing we're, we're working with AST on right now is we're in a rule committee uh, thing where the uh, industry gets together and we work together as a team and we're gonna make some recommendations to AST for what those regulations might look like. So I think it's inappropriate to say we're not working forward on those regulations right now. We are actively starting to work those together as an industry team and making recommendations. I think the first step we're doing is we're trying to understand what is the benefit of regulations? Why, why are we doing regulations? Are they to help the industry? Are they to fill in a safety hole gap? What is the purpose of the regulations? And then once we understand that purpose for the regulations, then I can think we can be start to build some consensus about what those regulations should be. So I think it's important to recognize that we're already actively working that and it's appropriate to extend this learning period for a significant period of time while we have these discussions amongst ourselves and we can make coherent and complete recommendations back to the FAA. Yeah, just one point I'd like to add. It's a great question. You pointed out that we just started flying commercial astronauts just a couple of years ago. So we're still learning. So the learning period is appropriate. And extending the learning period for the, the kind of time that we're talking about here is not only going to allow us to develop experience through operations and improve our safety systems, it's also gonna allow new entrants into this industry. We don't wanna shut the door behind us because the lead we have is remarkable and we need to continue that going forward. Thank you. Um, I now recognize um, Senator Schmidt for his um, first set of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Gersenmeyer, Mr. Joyce, this is for you two primarily. Um, an example of I think some really intriguing uh, a development here in potentially critical technology is nuclear propulsion. Talked a little about this a little bit um, yesterday. Uh, and you both talk about how uh, important sustained testing is uh, to the organization if you, and uh, further development of your vehicles. Can you both talk about how just a one day delay in the mission or uh, the result of a delayed FAA license can set back uh, you know, missions for months, right? I mean, how does that, how does that work for you? And, and I think, um, I guess the second part of that, and I'll just ask and let you guys go, as you look to potentially integrate nuclear propulsion uh, into Starship or, or New Glenn or future vehicles, can you talk about how the delays in that, you know, the launch or testing of these vehicles jeopardizes future integration of technologies like I mentioned um, nuclear propulsion in getting us to Mars specifically? Yeah, first of all, I would say that, you know, our approach to the way we do development is we have a very aggressive test program where there's no humans on the spacecraft and we test the spacecraft in an environment to understand how it actually flies and operates. We also do that consistent protecting the public. We, we wanna make sure that no one gets hurt, nothing is damaged except maybe our own facilities, but we use that as a, a series of test flights. With that approach, it's important we fly as soon as we can, the hardware is really ready to go fly. When we have regulatory delays, such as we're facing right now, that slows down this developmental test flight, and that ultimately slows down our support to NASA and slows down our support to, to what we need to do for the to return humans back to the surface of the moon again. So it, it's critically important that these delays may seem small in the, the big scheme of things, but a delay, can you, continuous delay of each and every test flight just adds up and eventually we'll lose our lead and, and we will see China land on the moon before we do. And that would be a shame if we did that only because of regulatory burden and we didn't do it because we were not technically ready to go achieve and innovate. So I think it's absolutely critical we get a regulatory framework that allows us to fly at the fastest flight rate that we can fly at and fly still safely and protect the public and protect people on board. In terms of nuclear propulsion, I think that's a very interesting technology that's coming online. I think research from other agencies like NASA and other organizations are appropriate to go look at that. Um, when that technology kind of gets developed by some of the other government agencies, then we on the private sector can pull that in and start using that in our operational vehicles. But 
I think our focus right now is, is trying to, to push the capability to bring this next generation of heavy lift launch vehicles in place, Starship, that can support multiple destinations to the moon and ultimately to Mars and help us have this vision of moving human presence into the solar system. I guess I guess what added is that, that nuclear propulsion is a game changer for in space operations. It, it's it's an incredibly attractive technology. Um, it obviously needs a careful consideration for safety considerations. We think it's it's important that that yeah you, you asked a question about delays and launch. And so for commercial endeavors where private investment is being brought to bear, uh, significant private investment delays in the process are very expensive. We want to enable industry to move as quickly as possible in a safe way. Um, working with the government agencies that are appropriate, an interagency process, because really it all starts with launch. And getting through the, those, those regulations and, and streamlining these processes are, is important for this kind of a game changer technology going forward. Um, and as both of you know, just as a follow up, um, we discussed yesterday, I serve you know, on this committee and then also on the Armed Services Committee. And both your companies uh, contract with, with DOD. Uh, and support vital national security efforts. Can you talk a little bit about um, the balance between truly national security missions and truly commercial missions and why it's important that one not limit the other? Well, at Blue Origin, and I, and I think uh, um, my colleague here will say the same thing, that the, a lot of the commercial activity enables the defense activity and vice versa. Uh, private investment, significant private investment in, in commercial human spaceflight at, at Blue Origin is enabling technologies that are being applied, applied to our DA, DOD contracts. Specifically, the, the technologies that I work on on New Shepard are being utilized on the New Glenn heavy launch vehicle. That is the launch vehicle that the Space Force is looking at and we are uh, uh, excited to uh, hopefully participate in that program going forward. Um, these investments, these technologies, processes, and people uh, provide a coupling between the two. Um, and, and provide a, a, a more rapid delivery of capability to uh, the Space Force in particular. And, and I would totally agree that they're very synergistic, the commercial and the, the, the national security activities really feed off of each other. Starship, which we're doing for commercial activities predominantly, will have tremendous benefit to the national security space side. We'll have a new capability to launch extremely large satellites to low Earth orbit and also sponsor missions around the moon and other areas. So again, there's a natural synergy between the two. Even Starlink that we're using for commercial internet services has applications in the secure, national security domain. So there's a very strong synergy between that. To be a leader in technology allows you to be a leader in the commercial activities, but also in national security activities. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cruz is the ranking member of the full um, Commerce Subcommittee, and he's now recognized for his opening statements. Thanks so much, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Schmidt. Thank you both for the terrific job you're doing with this very important subcommittee, and welcome to each of the witnesses. Uh, since I was first elected to the Senate 11 years ago, I have been proud uh, to help lead nearly every major piece of space legislation that's been signed into law. Just last year, as part of my NASA Authorization Act, which I led alongside Senator Sinema, Senator Wicker, and Senator Cantwell. Uh, that legislation was included in the Chips and Sciences Act, securing, among other things, an extension of the International Space Station to 2030. I'm especially proud that Texas is at the forefront of American leadership in space. From NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, home to our astronaut corps and mission control, to the myriad of commercial space companies across the state, including SpaceX and Blue Origin, who are both here today, the road to the final frontier runs through Texas. But we can't rest on our laurels. As the pace of commercial space activity has picked up, our regulatory system has started to strain and is now showing serious cracks. Some of our witnesses have hit on this point today, but it's worth noting that if the system breaks and the commercial space industry grinds to a halt, the risk is far more substantial than a few billionaires losing their ability to take joy rides in space. The government relies on a vibrant domestic commercial space sector for access to space, whether that is transporting our astronauts to the ISS, sending rovers to Mars, launching national security missions, 
or any of the other myriad space missions. On most policy issues, my philosophy is quite clear. Get government out of the way to the greatest extent possible and let the private sector roar. I believe the commercial space sector holds tremendous potential, and I've long said that I think the first trillionaire will be made in space. Previously, a domain exclusively of governments, upstart commercial companies have helped democratize space in a way that very few thought possible even a decade ago. Along the way, they have helped drive down the price point of launch, which has helped save the taxpayer money and has led to a proliferation of new technologies and plans for in-space activities. But to accommodate this growth and to enable the future potential, the regulatory framework must be clearly defined, allow for innovation and be accountable for the actions it does or does not take. As we think about regulation in commercial space, top of mind for many is the expiration of the learning period. This is understandable and an issue we need to, and I believe will address, but we need to answer the broader and more definitional questions about what the future of regulation looks like, not just for the next two years, but for the next 20. The prior administration did good work to try to update and modernize launch and reentry regulations, but there's a lot of work still to be done. Similarly, we need to address the still burdensome remote sensing regulations, and we need to cut red tape around all the various types of permitting that permeate commercial space. This hearing today is an opportunity to learn from those in industry, in the academy, and from a former policymaker about the state of commercial space and to reflect on how the current regulatory scheme is or is not working. In my opinion, too many agencies are involved. It slows technological and scientific advancements, and it puts us at, at a disadvantage compared to our international competitors and rivals. It is long past time that we create a true one-stop shop for the regulation and licensing of commercial space activities and make the United States the destination of choice for commercial space companies looking to set up shop. That all starts with regulatory certainty, transparency, and accountability. Finally, I mentioned the ISS. It is imperative that the U United States maintain a human presence in low Earth orbit. With ISS's mission extended until 2030, it is important to talk about what is next. Not only is LEO the tip of the spear on commercialization of space, but more fundamentally, it is a strategic domain where we cannot afford to cede our leadership, especially to communist China. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and to continuing to work with Chairwoman Cantwell, Subcommittee Chairwoman Sinema, Ranking Member Schmidt, as we together craft a bipartisan, bold, and forward-looking commercial space bill. Thank you. Senator Cruz, you're recognized for your questions if you'd like to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gerstenmeyer, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your many years of service with NASA. I think I can speak for many members of this committee when I say that we were all watching with excitement as Starship made its first test flight at Boca Chica earlier this year. And we look forward to you all proceeding with your next launch and more as you get ready to help put American boots back on the lunar surface. I also greatly appreciated the, the opportunity recently to visit Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas over the August recess to see firsthand the incredible work that SpaceX is doing in South Texas. And I don't want to exclude Mr. Joyce here. Van Horn is on my list, and I'm planning to get out and see the great work Blue is doing in West Texas as well. Look, the commercial space industry is at an inflection point. Industry, with some government support, but also leveraging immense amounts of private capital, has brought new novel technologies into production that hold the potential to do everything from closing the digital divide in broadband internet to making the human race truly multiplanetary. They are ready to, for, to take off if only we will let them. 
Now, Mr. Gerstemeyer, you have extensive experience with space vehicle development and space operations. I want to ask you what may seem like a simplistic question, but it gets at something you raised in your testimony. In your experience, and obvious, obviously there are caveats, are flight-proven vehicles and hardware more or less reliable than vehicles and hardware that aren't flight-proven? I think there's a tremendous advantage of a flight-proven vehicle. You see that in the reusability of the Falcon program. You know, we've, we've flown 74 flights this year. We learn from every one of those flights. And that learning, if we're open and transparent and we see where problems are, we can fix those small problems before they become big problems. So sometimes it's seen as we're rushing to flight, but we're actually, by flight testing, we're sex effectively flight testing the vehicle every time we fly and we're learning and we're developing. We're doing the same thing with Starship. Starship's test flight may, to some, have looked like a failure. It was not a failure. It was a huge learning experience for us. We gained more data from that flight, more knowledge that helps us advance than we could have through a thousand years of analysis and mathematical studies and tests. Going to flight, still protecting the public, keeping the environment safe, allows us to move at the fastest pace we can. So I'm a strong supporter of active flight test. Well, thank you. I, I very much agree, and, and I think that is objectively correct. But to pull on this thread, articles in the Washington Post and Ars Technica yesterday discussed how SpaceX has been ready for its second Starship launch for weeks, but is now apparently waiting on the Fish and Wildlife Service, who, just to be crystal clear, they don't launch rockets. But Fish and Wildlife needs to finish its consultation next month. I can't help but be concerned that bureaucratic red tape at AST and Fish and Wildlife and from other agencies have injected themselves into the launch licensing process. All of these agencies have already conducted and approved an environmental review for the first launch of Starship. But since SpaceX is going to keep trying, now the federal government wants to do another entirely duplicative environmental review. Do you think other agencies' involvement is speeding up or slowing down SpaceX's ability to test, launch, and iterate vehicle development? As we're, it's, it's a shame when our hardware is ready to fly and we're not able to go fly because of regulations or re-review. The fact that we can get the launch pad repaired and get it ready to go fly, support a flight. The fact that I can get a vehicle manufactured and ready to go fly. We have three or four other vehicles also ready to go fly. The pace of our test flight should not be governed by the regulation. We need to be safe. We need to protect the environment. We don't dismiss those, but we need to fly at the fastest pace that we can do hardware development to do this, this active development process and this test flight experience that we've described. Well, again, I agree with that. At AST's current speed, what's the earliest HLS will be ready? It, it's hard to say. I, we've got it, you know, the, we need to fly at the fastest pace. To be fair, we also have huge technical challenges, right? This is a large spacecraft we're building. You got to see it when you went down to Boca. It's an amazing vehicle. But 33 engines, the staging, all this is new technology. We need to test that soon, learn what's wrong, fix it, and go fly again. And we cannot be held up by regulation. So it's hard for me to give a specific date of where we are, but the current pace where regulation is driving, that should not be the case. The burden should be put on us as a private company, put on SpaceX, and let us develop at the fastest pace. We should be the ones that are driving the development, not being driven by regulatory oversight. Well, and having seen firsthand what you're doing in South Texas, it is extraordinary and very, very impressive. My final question, if you were still at NASA, would this delay be acceptable? Would schedule delays like this be something that makes a NASA program successful? Simply would not be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Senator Peters. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome to each of our witnesses. Uh, happy to have you here. And 
Thanks for helping us better understand the opportunities uh, as well as the, the challenges uh, for, for this industry. I want to take my uh, time for the, at least my first question, talk a little bit about uh, a key aspect uh, to a successful commercial space industry, and that's having a domestic uh, supply chain that's uh, vibrant uh, and uh, resilient. I'm proud that Michigan is a top 10 state in aerospace manufacturing. We have over 600 aerospace related companies, uh, and I'm very proud to say we're continuing to grow at a very robust rate. Uh, I have heard it in some of your testimony uh, here today, and uh, certainly I've heard from my former colleague, uh, Bill Nelson, who is now the NASA administrator, uh, who I think is a dream job for him, uh, given his passion, uh, that we are uh, basically in a space race uh, with China, and I think all of you will agree. And certainly, uh, if we're in that race, we need to support a robust domestic supply chain uh, uh, to win that race. And that's why I authored uh, two bills uh, about domestic aerospace supply chains that were actually signed into law uh, last Congress through the uh, Chips and Science Act. But my question uh, for you, uh, Mr. Uh, Kirsten Meyer and Mr. Joyce and anybody else who would like to join in, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to comment uh, basically on what your companies are doing to ensure that you are indeed relying on a strong domestic uh, supply chain for commercial space activities, uh, and also if you could uh, address if there are any bottlenecks in the supply chain that we should be aware of and perhaps could be helpful uh, in addressing. Uh, Mr. Joyce, you want to start and Mr. Germain? Yeah, thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, Blue Origin is heavily dependent on a robust supply chain for all of our operations, New Shepard, New Glenn, and our in-space systems. We have multiple partnerships with companies around the United States uh, that are supporting us, including in your state, Senator. So, so the robustness of the supply chain, particularly uh, coming out of the pandemic, when we were all challenged to, uh, to, to meet our commitments and to support our development schedules with a supply chain that was struggling, kind of highlighted our, our need to better engage and to go deeper with that supply chain. That's what we're doing today at Blue Origin, uh, developing long-term partnerships, long-term agreements with a number of ours. We're also uh, partnering with, uh, with local uh, manufacturing companies in all the states where we operate. So it, it lifts the entire industry um, beyond the direct expenditures at Blue and the, and the people that we employ to hundreds or not thousands of people throughout the country throughout our supply base. And, and the, that supply chain, how much of that is domestic? Uh, almost all of it, sir. There, there are very few things that we have to go uh, um, uh, overseas for, and we are focused first on domestic supply. Great, great. And, Mr. And, Meyer. and I would say that, you know, this year we're going to attempt to fly 100 flights. Uh, we have a very strong dependence upon the supply chain for a lot of parts that we put together and assemble into parts for our vehicles. As we look to next year, we want to increase that flight rate to about 12 flights per month or 144 flights is our goal. We've already reached out now where we're offering uh, multi-year contracts to suppliers to provide us hardware. We're also pushing some of the reliability aspects to the suppliers where we used to do inspections when the hardware came in house. We're now pushing that inspection back to the suppliers. So they're becoming more of an active participant with us moving forward. So the supply chain is critical to us as we move forward and try to achieve these higher flight rates. So I asked the second question, so I didn't hear, are there any bottlenecks uh, out there that we, certainly we, we identified a lot of those after the pandemic. Uh, you've been working through those. Are there other things that you're concerned about uh, that we should be aware of? I think for us, it's been just to keep up with the rate of, of demand we have for the, the parts and pieces. And I think before we didn't order is in a larger quantity as we are now. And we think we're, that's going to help remove some of that bottle, bottleneck if we let the uh, sub suppliers know what the anticipated demand is, they can then spool up and get ready to supply at the higher rates. Right. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Yeah, I, I don't think I think I don't think I would point to a to single or even a few um, supply chain issues that really drive up drive us. Um, there traditionally have been things that we've scrambled and recovered from, um, uh, but we uh, I, we can we can take that question and get you an answer. Yeah, I appreciate some it. detail. Thank you. Anybody else uh, have anything? If not, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for uh, kindly giving us your time today and for all your work in terms of promoting space and the incredible acceleration we've seen in our aerospace industry in the country and in the world. Um, Mrs. Shenowark, I'll start. I have a question. I have a question for each of you, so if I don't hopefully keep your answers short, and I'll get as far as I can. 
Uh, as our nation's aerospace economy continues to grow, uh, private sector, as we've heard all through this hearing, uh, private sector needs clear and predictable rules to govern outer space activities. Um, Colorado obviously has a, a strong aerospace component. A lot of companies working on everything from new commercial space stations that can host research and, and tourism in space uh, to technologies that will remove orbital debris uh, or manufacture parts in space. Um, these new activities do not fall under any singular agency's regulatory uh, purview. Ms. Shenwork, uh, what lessons should Congress learn from the most recent uh, regulatory reform efforts uh, in terms of developing uh, the mission authorization framework? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Senator Hickenlooper, I'll start by commending you and your staff because you're doing exactly what I would recommend, which is engaging with industry. So I think that the effort to engage with industry is really important. And what on some of the other topics that we've addressed today, like the regulation of launch, the oversight of nuclear thermal propulsion, for example, there is a need to have that deep engagement with industry in order to make sure that we're tailoring um, legislation and then the regulations to follow so that they can be flexible and appropriate to the core aspect of what we're trying to address, which generally speaking is public safety or a national security need. So how do we define what we're trying to address, make sure that we're getting to that core root concern, and then tailoring the legislation in a timely manner to that issue and making sure that as we move forward, we're not overreaching. We're thinking about what we're doing today, making sure we can pressure test against that and then prepare for a future state where we can address future opportunities. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Gerstenmeier, uh, this is something I've been uh, talking about for a couple years. Uh, there are over 900,000 pieces of dangerous orbital debris traveling faster than the speed of a bullet uh, hurling through space right now. It not only threatens the International Space Station, uh, but it, it threatens our human exploration programs, commercial space activities, uh, satellite constellations, go down the list. Um, so Mr. Gerstenmeier, what are the consequences for a commercial in space activities if we don't quickly uh, mature our capabilities uh, to be able to track down and remove dangerous uh, debris objects? I think it's an important that we uh, recognize that the debris environment is there. We design our spacecraft to be uh, protective of that to some extent for the smaller particles. For the larger objects, uh, for example, on Starlink, we have automatic collision avoidance in the satellites themselves. So they actually maneuver on their own uh, based on data to avoid collisions with other aspects. And that's another ad advance, I think, that can help prevent uh, generation of debris but I think we need to recognize that debris environment is there. Um, I think it's just naturally there in some extent and we can protect for it as, as much as we can through spacecraft design, but also make sure that the systems we deploy in space limit the amount of debris that are, that are generated as we deploy other spacecraft. Well, the, certainly the debris is naturally there, but it's growing at a, you know, it threatens exponential growth um, if we're not careful. Uh, Ms. Badla, um, as in space, activities and new spacecraft enter orbit, so does the congestion in, in LEO. And um, again, I think the activity and the acceleration of activity is a good thing for our leadership in, uh, in space. Uh, as the Government Accountability Office and other agencies have noted though, these activities also increase collision risks. Uh, it's not just the increase in objects that are out there, but it's the traffic. Um, and uh, in many cases pose potential impacts to astronomy. How should the U.S. balance maintaining our leadership in space with our obligations to making sure that we are maintaining a safe and operable um, space environment? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, so Virgin Galactic is a purely suborbital operations, but um, I think you touch on a very important point. When we talk about um, regulations that don't hinder innovation and al allow for companies to innovate and create new capabilities. That is also for creating capabilities, not just technologies that are, excuse the pun, out of this world, but <laughs> creating capabilities that enhance safety and efficient operations. Um, if I can just make a quick example in the aviation world, actually, um, experimental aircraft were way ahead in avionics systems uh, than certified aircraft. 
Um, and they were able to, and certified uh, aviation companies were not able to adapt because going back and taking the time and resources for changing the certification did not provide them incentive and allow them to say this was safe enough. So regulations that are light touch that promote innovation but do not hinder, sa that keep safety as priority also enhance safety as and uh, efficient operations for the entire industry as well. Yeah, that's something I've, we've heard consistently from all of you, that this uh, priority is space, to safety in space, and I think we're hearing that loud and clear. I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Senator Lujan. Um, I will yield to the chair. No, no, Senator Lujan, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that very much. Um, Ms. Bandla, it, it's good to see you today, and my first question is directed towards Towards you and, and your expertise, I think all of the companies here today agree that the commercial space industry is poised for explosive growth. Um, that's clearly a consensus here in the United States Senate as well. Um, but speci specifically at the spaceport in New Mexico. And so those of you looking to grow a little bit, come visit New Mexico. We have a space for you, so come on down. Now, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation has maintained an outstanding record of protecting public safety according to their statutory mandate. But as the cadence of launches and number of applications continue to grow, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, also known as AST, faced challenges with its workforce and licensing capacity. So here's the question. Are there ways that Congress can help AST keep up with the growing number of license applications while maintaining its excellent public safety record. Thank you, Senator. And it's been such a great year. We've flown five times in five months from Spaceport America. Uh, the state has been an incredible partner in being able to hit that cadence of operations. And of course, uh, our partnership with the FAA as well uh, enabled that. Um, absolutely, it's natural. As the industry grows, we're at this inflection point where you're seeing a higher cadence of flight, more frequent flights, uh, diverse vehicles. It is natural to also have the regulatory agency grow as well and be provided with the adequate amount of resources and expertise to keep up with that pace. And these resources will allow FAA to uh, process licenses, um, allow companies to operate at this cadence, and especially take a look at their licensing process now and look at ways to make it more efficient and more effective, not just add bodies, but look at the licensing portal, how we can make it electronic, how companies can track their licenses and status in a much more efficient way to relieve that stress on the actual bodies at the agency as well. So there's a lot of conversations we can have on how we make that agency more effective at, um, in licensing, but it starts with giving them the adequate resources to be able to do so. I appreciate that, Ms. Bondula. Just as a reminder, it doesn't get too hot, it doesn't get too cold, and once you climb above the hot air balloons, you're good to go. Um, and the food is pretty good, so come on down. Now, Ms. Schwenewerk, the FAA has uh, restricted uh, or was restricted from enforcing regulations specific to safeguarding the well-being of pain and non-pain customers or occupants aboard commercial space launches and re-entries to allow emerging spaceflight companies to gather experience, data, statistics, and other information. Since this learning period began, emerging commercial space flights have provided, have proceeded at a cautious pace. Um, given that, as the commercial human spaceflight industry works up to full-scale regulation, how can Congress help the FAA and commercial spaceflight industry leaders begin to work together to compare their initial data and statistics to share lessons learned, to outline a regulatory plan that addresses the safety of pain and not pain customers and other occupants aboard commercial spaceflight? Senator, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. So I think first and foremost is that no people get to space without having the launch vehicle licensed. So I really want to reiterate the points that my colleagues have made today about the importance of making sure that the FAA's launch and reentry regulations that govern launch, whether it's a satellite for national security, civil, commercial space, or it's a human spaceflight participant, that, that launch licensing regime and reentry regime needs to be improved, and the resources that need to go into that for training, the implementation of better processes, all of that will benefit any activity that involves human spaceflight. 
So I think first and foremost, those improvements need to occur. The second is an aspect that is ongoing, and that's the engagement through the Space Advisory Rulemaking Committee, specifically on Part 460 right now, which addresses the regulations that are existing now, because despite a lot of thought, um, to the contrary, the contrary is true, which is there are regulations addressing both the crew, so the humans that are on board that are involved in flying or even off the ship that are flying the space vessel, um, as well as the um, space flight participants. So there are regulations, and those are part of discussion with industry through an FAA advisory rulemaking committee today. I also want to highlight the work of Comstack, so the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, which is a FACA that advises the FAA. That is an important um, organization and entity that can provide inputs and review of FAA documents and plans. And I'll note that recently the FAA released a document on occupant safety. Unfortunately, the Comstack wasn't able to review and opine on that document ahead of its release. And I think that the document and the engagement with FAA um, and the outcome would have benefited from that industry engagement. So I think there are a number of steps, also ASTM, so the work that's happening with um, uh, standard writing with industry, that pace has increased as we've seen a pace of human spaceflight and experience increase. All that said, to my colleagues' prior points, very few flights are happening right now um, in terms of the, the numbers. We have the opportunity to start getting it right, to start establishing a plan, and that plan really calls upon true engagement between the experts in industry who are developing this diverse set of capabilities and the folks within the regulatory agency that need to get smart and need to deeply engage with those activities, but first they need to get good at doing the regulations that they have on the books today. I appreciate that. And Mr. Joyce, I have a question. I'm going to have to submit it into the record because I've exceeded my time. But I want to commend your team over at Blue Origin. I had the honor to visit facilities in Washington State recently. And it's quite incredible what is being built there, um, the expertise of that team as well. Um, but quite an impressive facility. So I um, look forward to visiting more about that and getting those questions submitted. Uh, Madam Chair, yield back. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Lujan. And I want to thank. Uh, Senator Cinema and Schmidt for holding this subcommittee hearing and all of you for participating today. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate all my colleagues obviously being here and asking important questions. Uh, we have reached new heights, including the striking images of new galaxies from the James Webb Telescope. The U.S. space program continues to evolve and forge ahead with partnerships between the public and the private sector. Uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 was the first to take the NASA astronauts to the International Space Station, and now civilians are riding on the edge of space and commercial aircraft. So we're very excited about all of this in the state of Washington. We like to say that Seattle is the Silicon Valley of space. That is the intersection of software and hardware and probably Boeing engines and other things all coming together. And I think we have something like 4.6 billion in economic activity and 13,000 jobs. So we had uh, the NASA administrator out this past summer to talk about some of that innovation and, and a little sharper focus on workforce issues. Very concerned about workforce needs at FAA, at NASA, in the space sector in general and what we need to do to further uh, incent or encourage young people and people of diversity, particularly women, to go into that field. And uh, certainly uh, wanted to continue the R&D innovation and collaboration, but really start thinking about uh, what one might consider um, high rate piece part manufacturing juxtaposed to where we've been thus far. So how do you speed up the next level of aviation airspace construction, and what do we need to do to be really good at that? So those were some of the conversations we had in Seattle with the administrator and a great group of, of uh, participants from a variety of uh, segments. And I wanted to follow up today first with that question about STEM and workforce. Uh, very excited that NASA continues to play a very big role for the FAA, and we're really with the FAA safety bill that we passed a couple of years ago trying to increase the technical expertise at the FAA in next generation technology issues. What do we need to do to get this right at NASA and in the private sector in encouraging a very, very robust space workforce? And just go right down the panel. 
So I, I think you're right to focus that there, there is a need uh, within the FAA to make sure that we are able to attract and retain um, excellent talent there. So you know, some ideas have been put forward about the idea of um, expediting hiring opportunities. I also think collaboration between industry and government with regard to employees. So we have um, employees that go from one agency to another agency, but in some instances there are opportunities, um, for example, with this former Air Force, Space Force, where um, there were embeds from, in, from government with industry. And that really does foster a technical interchange and an understanding. And that also can help um, understand that the opportunities that are in government to stay in government. So, you know, for example, I'll commend um, my colleague here, Mr. Monteith, um, who left the Air Force then and then went into government service again to work with the space industry at the um, at AST. And those kinds of, of exchange of information, even from government agency to government agency, but particularly where we can foster from industry movement and exchange there. Okay, we'll have to go more quickly on our answers down the panel. Uh, thank you, Chair Kemwell. Uh, I would simply put it in, in two buckets. Number one, I think we have need to have a much more or a much more robust intern program uh, to get them, uh, the college grads or future college grads, interested early into government service in those technical fields. And number two, uh, tagging on to Ms. Shenowork's comments, when I was in FAA, we had started looking at how do we move back and forth, not from government agency to government agency, but from government agency to industry and back because I think the, the entire system would be better served from having uh, more technically uh, knowledgeable and advanced uh, employees on both sides. Okay. Thank you. I completely agree with both my colleagues. I just uh, um, talk about the underrepresented group, um, look at programs that invest in demographics that don't tip, you don't typically see in industry, women, people of color, um, they don't have the same opportunities as others. So programs that do reach that group, and it's interesting because I am a woman, person of color. I, I joined this industry and believed I could succeed in this industry because I met people from this industry doing incredible things, and that made it real and made it possibility. So let's look, let's look at programs that reach out to those communities so, that don't have those opportunities. You know, I would add that if there's an exciting mission, that people can get really excited about it and they can see a sense of the future that's brighter and, and a, a chance to really open the horizon. Space gives you that opportunity to think about a better future and I think we can entice the young people to get excited about that. And then if we can also be open to new technology, if we can take what they've learned in gaming, what they've learned in computer worlds and bring that into our world, we can expedite manufacturing. And I think we also need to be extremely open in the diverse areas. We need to be open to all ideas and not assume that anyone doesn't have an idea that is, has value and cannot be used. We need to be open to every idea, look for innovation. And the same thing even with the regulatory environment, we can no longer continue the same process. We need to look for ways to be innovative and creative and open the aperture so we can accept diverse opinions and different ways of doing business. If we keep doing things the same way, we won't get the results we want, but Thank I think you. that excites the young generation. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Yeah, I, I think the, the only thing I'd add, and, and my colleagues have made some of these points, is play the long game. Expand the workforce, right? How do you do that? You get, you get more women, more people of color engaged, and you start that at an incredibly early age to make it more attractive, more appealing to those groups to, to join the, 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 the type of workforce that we need in this industry and the FA needs to regulate. Make the pool bigger, start early, uh, Blue is sponsoring a Club for the Future, which is a, uh, uh, a, a STEM program that starts in preschool, starts in, in elementary school. I think we need more of that. Starts in preschool? It starts in, starts in, 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 in kindergarten, actually. Okay. We have number, close enough. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but why not, right? It's, it's, it's one of those things where you want that culture, you want these people to, to grow with that opportunity to see people, like my colleague, Ms. Ms. Bonley here, um, doing what she's doing and be able to, to do that themselves. So well, I think that's that's how we do it. Yeah, definitely as an application of a STEM occupation, I don't think you could get something more exciting or more interesting, so we would hope. But I do think we, as I've traveled to various facilities around the country, it's clear to me that there are a lot of technical people at our uh, space facilities. They don't have four-year degrees. And we need to send out a big, loud message everywhere that these are technical jobs that are well-paying jobs, but that uh, we need to, I don't know if there's this 
if we're missing a space at the community college where we're saying this is your space technician uh, program or something like that, but I feel like we should be doing more in this particular area. As I said, my region very interested in this as we transfer more to uh, large scale, man I mean, more rapid pace manufacturing and uh, production. And then I'm going to sit for the record, uh, Madam Chair, this question, you know, which today's hearing isn't squarely on, but uh, well, I just want to make one more point about this. I literally believe that we have to start thinking about CTOs and maybe even CTOs by sector. By that I mean, if you think about it, you know, within the FAA, there may be a CTO specific to certification and there may be a CTO specific to commercial space. I just think that changes in technology are so rapid that you need somebody who is the overall guidance when it comes to the types of innovations we're seeing. How else do we keep a whole workforce at the FAA up to speed on that? I ran into a gentleman in my, my community, Edmonds, Washington, but that's where you will run into a lot of Boeing engineers just walking around <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. But he said, uh, you know, we used to have chief engineers. And he said there's never a way to fool the chief engineer. You always were afraid to go in front of them because you knew you were never gonna fool them. And so the point is, that now we have all this technological change and it's so big. And as the FAA grapples with still certifying commercial airplanes, but then trying to figure out how to certify space travel, how are we going to do that without some uh, key technology leaders at key posts within the FAA? Okay, so I'll submit some uh, questions for the record on that, but I thank the witnesses for this hearing and appreciate the input, particularly on the safety side, but also on how we uh, come back to this issue of the uh, certification uh, that is expire, the um, learning period that's expiring and what we need to do for the future. So thank you. Well, thanks so much, Chair Cantwell. And with that, we've reached the end of today's hearing. And once again, thank you to all of our witnesses for their participation. The hearing record will remain open for four weeks until November the 15th of 2023. Any senators that would like to submit questions for the record should do so within two weeks from now by November 1st, 2023. And I ask that witness responses be returned to the committee by November 15th, 2023. And that concludes today's hearing.